What's up everybody? Dr. Rossi, Shrinks and Sneakers. I'm a board certified psychiatrist making mental health content here on YouTube. And if you're new to the channel, I would love for you to become a subscriber to this community. It really means a lot to me. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for the love and support. So today's topic is one that I've been thinking about for a while. And I made a video a ways back about antipsychotic induced weight gain and kind of ways of mitigating some of this weight loss if you are indeed, or weight gain rather, if you are on these medications. And, you know, people really were upset in some ways because they felt like diet and exercise wasn't enough. So I felt like what better topics to tackle here than the neurobiology of appetite. And I'm going to explain to you guys why it's actually really hard to lose weight and keep it off. You can lose weight, but it's really tough to keep it off. So I'm going to talk about it here and more. And so stay tuned and we're going to crack right into it right now. So have you guys ever noticed how even in your own life, you alter the quantity and frequency of food consumption throughout the day, sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes throughout the week. And yet, for some reason, our brain has a way of regulating this process that essentially allows people to maintain a relatively stable body weight month after month. So this is like this is really wild stuff, right? Isn't that a little crazy that our brain has a way of keeping us a certain body weight, even though we vary our quantity and frequency of eating on a regular basis. Now, anyone who's ever tried to diet before knows all too well about how the metabolic set point works, right? We don't, we might not understand what that means yet, but we do know about it, I guarantee it. So there are staggeringly low rates of success when people diet. People actually don't do well on diet programs. And in fact, there was a systematic review of studies published between 1931 and 1999 that found that only 15% of patients achieved dietary success after five years. So only 15% of people who were on diets achieved what would be considered a level of success after five years. Most people who diet will slowly return to their pre-existing weight. Now wait for it, their pre-existing weight within one year. So one year, people return back to their normal weight. Now this is what we're calling the metabolic set point. And this happens to be controlled primarily by our genetics. So unfortunately, we don't have as much control over this as we might want. There's a strong correlation between body mass and biological parents. So you can look no further than your own mom and dad. And if your mom and dad happen to be a little bit heavier, then it's highly likely that you're going to be a little heavier. If your parents are lean, it's likely they're go that you're going to be lean, right? And this comes from adoption studies. So when children were adopted out, what they found was that in the case of weight, genetics has far more influence than environmental factors. Both are important, but genetics seems to outweigh environmental factors in these cases. So in an adoption study, what would happen essentially is the, pay, is the person would be removed from the biological mother and given to the adopted family. And then they would follow up with that patient later on and they would look at the biological mother and they, these people would be part of some type of study, right? They would have to agree to be a part of it, et cetera, et cetera. And what they found was that people were pretty much close to what their biological parents were, not the adopted parents. So obviously the environment of the adoptee changed or was altered but the biology obviously remained the same because you're carrying the genetics of your parents. Now, despite all of this, right, obesity rates in the United States, as well as other developed countries, continue to rise. So the question is, what gives? Why is that? Why do we continue to have problems with obesity? Well, our genes have difficulty responding to the modern environment. So if this was 3,000 years ago, when food sources were scarce, it was advantageous to consume, right? Consume as much as you could and store as many calories as possible because you never knew where another meal was going to come from. They, there wasn't a plentiful environment like there is today when you go to your local grocery store. So in the modern world, there's no shortage of opportunity to consume caloric dense foods and our genetics are working against us here, right? The weight issue is genetic but it's also influenced, like I said, by the availability of high calorie, delicious, tasty food, which we all have great access to. Okay, so we can think about this as a simple formula. When it comes to weight, the energy in food must equal the energy out. 
So the energy that comes in must equal the energy out or we gain weight. And the energy out can be divided into what we call heat and work. And the energy is made up of two components. So this is the important point. And the first one's a little more important than the second one. So the resting metabolic rate is the calories burned when the body is stationary. So when you're not doing any type of physical activity, and then of course, the calories burned when you're doing physical acts is going to be the physical activity, and, and that's separate, right? So we have a rested metabolic rate where this is what you would burn if you did nothing all day long, and obviously what you would burn in addition with physical activity. Now the brain has a unique mechanism for managing the resting metabolic rate. When more calories are consumed, the resting metabolic rate increases. So our body has a feedback loop, essentially, right? If I'm going to be eating more calories, I, my resting metabolic rate is going to have to increase to compensate for that additional calories. And the body's pretty smart. It does these things, right? So when we diet, and this is the important point, when we diet, the resting metabolic rate is turned down, so the body is actually working against us, right? I'm trying to lose weight and my body is working against me by turning down my resting metabolic rate. And to solidify this point, we actually can look no further than the biggest loser competition. So I'm sure most people have seen this show at one point or another in their life, or at least are aware of what it was. And this is where they got together a group of people who were obese, and they essentially put them on a workout routine and diet and saw who could lose the most weight right? Sounds easy. Now, someone actually was smart enough to do a study on this. So these investigators assessed 14 of the 16 contestants before the competition. And then after the competition, so at the completion of it, which was a 30 week program, and then six years after the show. So they wanted to know not only how these people were before the competition, how they were after the 30 weeks of training. And then of course, whether or not they maintained these changes six years down the road. What was so interesting here, and maybe a little disappointing, honestly, is that 13 of the 14 study participants actually regained the weight, at, and four of them were actually heavier than they were when they started the competition. So almost everybody regained the weight, and four of them actually gained more weight. So this is not good. This doesn't sound good at all, right? The real kicker was all of the patients or all of the participants burned less calories at rest six years after the show ended. So despite exercising more and theoretically being much healthier, their resting metabolic rate actually decreased. Now let's talk about the signals and other things that are involved with maintaining body weight. So in the 1940s, it was well established that the hypothalamus, since a part of the brain, that's usually known as like sort of the control center, is the major center controlling, of course, food intake as well as everything else, right? Body temperature, food intake, etc. The story is a little more complicated, obviously, than that, but the hypothalamus actually remains the important center and location for weight maintenance, and it's primarily where majority of the research has been conducted. Now, we're going to ask ourselves an important question here. What are the important signals used by the body that indicate when to eat and when to stop eating, right? Because there's got to be some way that this feedback mechanism works, a way that tells us stop consuming calories, you have too much energy, or continue consuming calories, you have too little energy, right? Now, this can be divided into multiple categories, and we're going to start first with the short-term signals. Now, short-term signals actually don't really influence weight gain over time. What they really do is they just regulate our eating patterns, right? So it doesn't actually influence whether or not somebody is going to gain or lose weight. And obviously, the first one that you might be thinking of here is glucose, right? Glucose is the main source of energy for our brain and other body parts, right? It's the breakdown product of many of the things we consume. So this is the primary nutrient that maintain, that mediates whether or not we are going to stop or continue eating. Now hypoglycemia, so low blood glucose or low blood sugar, will stimulate hunger naturally, right? If, you're, if you have low blood sugar, your body's gonna let you know you better eat something or you're gonna pass out, right? So this is going to increase your eating behavior. While glucose infusion, so if I were to put glucose in a, in a bag and put an IV on somebody, then they're going to decrease their food intake, right? Because they're going to feel more satiated. They're not going to feel hungry. 
The other short-term signal is mechanoreceptors that are located in the stomach and the gut. So when food enters the stomach, the stomach expands, right? And when the stomach expands, these mechanoreceptors are going to get stimulated, right? And they're going to, and that's going to be due to the stretching of the stomach when food's consumed. This is going to transmit signals via the vagus nerve, and that's going to let the hindbrain know to decrease eating behavior, right? Because the stomach is stretching out, the stomach is full, there's no reason to keep consuming more food. So that's our second short-term signal. The third one is going to be the gut hormones. Now, the most well understood of these is cholecystokinin, CCK, which is released by endocrine cells in the small intestine when you consume food. This will inhibit further food intake, stimulating the vagus nerve and decreasing gastric emptying. So that's the mechanism by which it decreases our consumption of food when we're eating. People, of course, have tried infusing CCK for weight loss, right? It makes sense. If, if increased CCK results in somebody decreasing or inhibiting their food intake, then maybe we can use it to help people lose weight. Unfortunately, it doesn't really help. What it actually did for people who received these infusions, because of course we tried it, they would actually end up just having a decrease in the size or portion size of the meals, but they would be eating more frequently. So it would essentially be a net zero effect, right? If I'm decreasing my portion sizes, but still consuming the same amount of food over the course of the day because I'm eating more often, I'm, going, I'm not going to change my weight. And the final one that I want to talk about here is called ghrelin. And this is the only gut hormone that stimulates hunger. So this is the one that makes you eat more. Some suggest that the decreased ghrelin produced by the stomach is actually the reason gastric bypass surgery is effective for weight loss, but this isn't totally teased out or proven, but it's an interesting theory. So there's a few additional topics I want to get to here and a few things I want to touch on that I think are important. So it's well known that adipose tissue actually releases a hormone. So your, your fat cells, your white fat cells, release a hormone that conveys information about energy stores. Leptin is that hormone. And it was, I think it was discovered back in 1994. And it's produced by white fat cells. It increases or decreases based on the total amount of fat one has on their body. Now, leptin is a hormone, and like I said, and it tells the body to stop eating. So this is a break. So this puts the brakes on eating. And in the case of obesity, leptin levels are high because, again, there's more fat stores. So energy expenditure actually increases, so your resting metabolic rate and things of that nature go up while your food intake decreases. So you can see how this sort of balances itself out. Now, when someone goes on a diet, and here's again how the body works against us, when someone goes on a diet, obviously your fat stores shrink, your leptin levels go down, and this results in decreased energy expenditure as well as increased food intake. Because again, the body's thinking like we need more energy storage, right? We're losing these fat stores. So this is how, again, how the body works against us. Now there's two more sets of neurons that I want to talk about in the arcuate nucleus that are important in terms of weight management. And these are found in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, and they're going to mediate the leptin signaling. The first one is pro-opiomelanocortin, P-O-M-C for short, and neuropeptide Y, N-P-Y for short. Now, P-O-M-C stops eating while N-P-Y increases food intake. So again, it's like one is the breaks, the P-O-M-C is the breaks, and the N-P-Y is going to increase your food intake and decrease energy expenditure. In obesity, there's increased leptin, right, like we've established, which is going to inhibit neuropeptide Y, and it's going to activate pro-opiomelanocortin, resulting in increased energy expenditure and decreased food intake. So we're going to put the brakes here on food intake, right, because the person already has increased leptin levels. The opposite is obviously true 
for lean individuals. They're gonna have the opposite effect from this. So let's go through it again because it's a little complicated. So in obesity, we know that there's increased leptin levels. Because of these increased leptin levels, we're going to inhibit neuropeptide Y. And remember I said that neuropeptide Y increases food intake. And it's going to activate pro-opiomelanocortin, POMC, resulting in increased energy expenditure. And of course, decreased food intake. And like I said, you can reverse that. The opposite would be true for an individual who is lean, who has low leptin levels. The last piece I want to talk about here is eating and pleasure. We've all had this experience before where it's been a stressful week, things weren't going our way, and we decide to go out for a nice meal with our family, significant other, whatever the case is, and instantly you feel better, right? You eat that delicious meal, you feel better. So it's well established that eating can result in pleasure and we've all had the experience, right? The pleasure from food is likely an adaptation that enhanced our survival at some point, right? When food sources were scarce, it was advantageous to have a pleasurable effect from eating because that would make us you know, work harder to go out and get those food sources and of course then survive and pass our genes on to the next generation. Now, the neurobiology is the same as any other substance use disorder or any other addiction pathway that we're talking about. So there's going to be increased dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, and the nucleus accumbens, of course, is, revolved, is involved in the reward pathway. We're going to show a diagram here. And there's also a release of endogenous opioids. So endogenous opioids are opioids that are produced by our own body. It's interesting. Our body produces opioids. Our body produces um, cannabinoids, our body produces benzodiazepines, etc., etc. So you get this increased dopamine and increased endogenous opioids are going to be more active when we are eating a meal that we enjoy. And of course, you can see how that might lead to potential addictions in the case of, say, foods that are high in sugar or high in fat that taste really good. So I'm going to hold the video there. I would love to take your questions and comments about this topic. And I just want to wrap it by kind of saying that we all have a metabolic set point. It's largely genetically determined. And our biology in many ways is working against us. And that's why things like exercise programs and diets are largely unsuccessful because our body is constantly working in this feedback loop to kind of maintain this metabolic set point. So we're a little bit disadvantaged depending on our genetics, depending on who our parents are, right, and et cetera, et cetera, things we really cannot control. So when some people say that gaining weight is a problem and no matter what they do, they can't really fix it, that, that's to some degree true based on the biology and the stuff that we discussed here. So I'm going to hold it there. If you guys haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing it. And we're going to make a part two to this where we're going to discuss obesity specifically.